Hey, Bo Barrett! Hey, how can you not believe that? That's the first time I've ever met you. All right, that's true. Sure. I don't get out that much. I'm, I'm like kind of a farmer from Calistoga. You know what I mean? We ain't travel that much. We interview a lot of farmers. Yeah, I all the do. Yeah, all the winemakers. Yeah. The winemakers, I think that if you think about winemakers, and you guys know them as well as I do, they fall into three categories. The artiste, you know, there's the ones with the cravat that want to be made in France. <laughs> and then, then you have the farmer who is like me. He's like, okay, yeah, and we're just growing grapes and doing the best we can to make good wine. And then, and then you have the scientists who all they want to talk about is the chemistry of the wine and stuff like that. And they all make different wines. The artiste makes these very showy fine wine wines that the farmers are making, you know, save from where they live, basically. Yeah. So it's pretty fun. And you know, I get along good with everybody. This, what are we drinking here? Is this is the this Zen? This is that Zen. This is our Zen, yeah. So we have Zen. When we bought Montalana in 72, we had mostly the Pro Vision varieties, like weird stuff you never heard of, like Sauvignon Bur burgers and stuff. Sure. And those were the, basically the Thompson seedless of the Prohibition era. They had just sh uh, sugar water bags. And they were no flavor at all. And then we had some decent grapes. You might have heard of Alicante Boucher. Sure, yeah. Uh, we had some cats out there. And so, but most of it had to be replanted. So there wasn't any Cabernet at Montalana, and there was a little bit of Zen. So if you know California, especially in the 70s and stuff, Zinfandel was really the go-to grape because you could make, as we, the sort of home guys put it, you can make, you know, basically white wine out of all the way to port. Yeah. You know, so it was really, um, you could always sell Zinfandel. So as the independent growers had a lot of Zen. So we had Zen too. And so we started making Zen um, from day one. And, but no cab on the property at that time. No, none at all. I would say one. It's kind of wild to think about when you shot the Montana, 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 Montana. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so, but you got to remember, this is, um, in the, like, as late as 1976, before the Paris tasting, the center of American winemaking is not in the North Coast, it's not in Napa Sonoma, it's moved to Modesto. Because the Gallows yes. have started this right. quality revolution in California. Yeah. And, you know, the, they really deserve a lot of credit for California's push to improve quality. Really started with Ernest and Julio, where they hired six PhDs. Happened to be my father in law, Dick Peterson, you know, the former winemaker for after Touch at BB, Heidi's dad. So those ex Gallo guys started coming out, and the quality revolution from guys like Dick Peterson coming up to BV, that's where you really start seeing the uh, quality of the North Coast wines improving, you know, exponentially, really. Is that where kind of CAD took? Old in Napa Valley around Well, that time? you got okay. Well, historically, at that time, there was still the BV Georges de la Tour, yeah, mm -hmm. and the Inglenook was famous. Now, Inglenook by that time it had been bought out. It was you know Inglenook involved corporate owned, and it was no longer a great wine even by that time. Huh. But BV Georges de la Tour. So everybody that knew about Napa Valley knew that it had potential for these great caps. Now you know, you got, and that's also there was no ABA system. There, there's, you know, it's just kind of a, you can plant anything anywhere, and everybody did plant anything in those days. But my dad knew from doing his research, he was an attorney, and so his research was like, what's this property going to do best at? And everything he could read from UC Davis on down was that this is going to be a cab property. So, but we, the only grape we had there was Zen. So, of course, you got to start this winery. It's got a dirt floor. All the vineyards got to be replanted. There was nothing, and we didn't have that much money to get started. So we had to get a cash flow. Deal. What's your business plan? So we uh, buy Riesling. That's a one-year wine. You get Chardonnay going. That's a two-year wine. Zinfandel is a three-year wine. What you got to do is go back in your time machine. You're planting Cabernet. You're not going to in '72 and '74 we plant. We're not going to get to really make an estate cab. The '77 is 75 percent estate cab. So we don't, we're going from '72 to '78 before we pick any Cabernet. And those days, Cabernet, I remember equipment's not that good, so there's a lot of stem there. They're very extremely tanned because they were picking up a lot of stem. Kind. Sure. So there were three years of the grow. So Cabernet was a four-year project at the time. So think about this. You're starting this winery, and you're not going to sell your dream wine for 10 years. So we don't get to sell the state cab until 1982. It's a lot of cash. Yeah. You're, you're, you're holding a lot of liquid. Yeah. So, you know. And, and, and. Well, think about it this way. It's like, okay, I'm going to plant a vineyard. Well, I got to buy a tractor. And I got to get some shovels. And I got to get some guys. And I get, so you get to spend money that. Now, then I got to pick some grapes. Ooh, now I need a destammer. And, and some more guys. And oh, 
What about barrels? Oh, I got to pay for some barrels too. Oh, what about bottling? Oh, I got it. Well, that you can actually borrow in those days. Like we went around, that was my job. I was like one of the head drivers for the company. I was, I was young, I was 18. So we hop in the pickup truck, go down to see the Raymond brothers, because you know, Barrett's been sold by them. Yeah. So the Raymonds, Walt and Roy were over at Raymond, and so I'd go borrow like a label from the Raymonds and a corker from Joe Heights, or you know, so, so all I was doing that, because my Gurge, our first white man, right. you know, he had worked for Mondavi and MEV, so he kind of knew everybody. And he was like, just give me orders, you know. And I actually worked for his son. I was like, go down and get the label. Yeah, yeah, boss. You know? Yeah, okay, snappy suit, and yeah. off I go. You know. Well, it's brilliant how you went about it, right? With the reason one year wine chart, two year wine, right? So you're having, you're still a couple years out, right? From the time you purchased the property, you yeah. still there's, you're not getting money for a few years. That's right. It's yeah. an investment. Yeah. So what, what made your dad decide to purchase the wine? Because an attorney, right? Yeah. So the way, the, way he, the way he jokingly told the story, he goes, you know, as your job as an attorney, your job is to make other people's lives miserable. And I was good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, but he was a super Catholic. He'll go to mass every day. I guess his parents were both Irish immigrants. Wow. And uh, so he uh, said, well, when I get to see St. Peter, I can't really be saying I was a lawyer when I get there. <laughs> so, so he decided he was going to make people happy. But one of his other law partners called it the tax dodge that got out of hand because in 1972, you have to go back, it's the Vietnam War, and you're pretty young, but you don't remember, the United States did go socialist at one time, and our tax rate was like 77% because the Vietnam War surcharge, and American agriculture is withering. My father's a real estate and tax attorney. So the Richard Nixon's president, John Connolly, Democrat, is when our government actually used to work and pass some good laws. So they passed the American Agriculture Reinvestment Act, where if you made a million dollars selling your real estate or your mall, you could invest a whole million dollars in American agriculture. So you think about Napa Valley in 68, 69, 70, what they have is they got the grapes, they got the people that want to make good wine, they want to have everything to go, but what they haven't got is the capital for the stainless steel tanks and the refrigeration systems and chillers and all that. So why did all these wineries start in 1972? Us, so broke, Joe Phelps, all those wineries. All of a sudden, 24 wineries started overnight? Why? Nobody tells the story. Oh, we were in love with the wineries. We always wanted to make something magnificent. Most of them were a tax auction. <laughs> Oh, cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And so, but it was still putting us on money, and that didn't last. So that was that one year, and it last that year. So then after that, it got to be normal. Uh, having a rational, solid business plan. And so that's how, as we're talking about, with the white wines to support it. And then in our, you know, lucky break, the second Chardonnay we ever made, of course, was the first day, so you know, away we go. So that really allowed us to fund the success of the Chardonnay allowed us to start selling the wine nationally because I remember in California, the chauvinism isn't necessarily a bad word where you're supporting the local guys. Like, you know like the Italian growers, the people go to Italy in their little town, hey, I tasted the wine from the town down the road, do you ever taste that wine? They go, I would, I got wine in my town. <laughs> well, in California, because the wine business out of Napa Valley was pretty solid for that. that, and we sold our wines in San Francisco and LA. And so the business was struggling, excuse me, struggling, but it wasn't desperately woeful, but it was impossible to sell in you know, like New York or, right. or Boston or Chicago or any of those wines. Like California wines, crappy. You know? And so that was, and so then, then we got to sell the wine and the prices definitely solidified for us. And um, that's really how we uh, funded that the that ensuing the 76, it takes another six years till we're selling the estate cap. So. You talked about earlier, you know, England had been bought, the Barringers had sold, mm -hmm. but you guys to this day still family owned? Yeah. To this day? Yeah, unbelievable. I am a remarkably lucky guy that um, my father passed away, and uh, and his, uh, being a Catholic, his, uh, his half of it, he's married. My parents have been divorced by about 1977, 78, something like that. And so what's not true in the movie is my brother and sister are still there. My brother's uh, fingerprints on the bottle in the Smithsonian too. My brother Mike blew the bottles. I filled them and my brother Kev put them in the box, you know. So it was like a family home winery at that time. It was a little handline and we're here to go, Joe McGee as they call it. So I'm very proud of my brothers, but they did not get the crazy farmer genes. And so anyway, the point being that 
the winery, my parents uh, both passed away. My father, being an attorney, had a very good estate plan for uh, his half of the winery. But my mom died with no estate plan to speak of, and we had to, we just successfully this year finished buying the. I got the vote of all brothers and sisters to stay and keep it. Cool. Not one of them wanted to buy a new airplane or a yacht or a boat. They all, and this we're talking about a retired firefighter, retired airplane mechanic, um, a high school teacher in Hawaii, and um, you know, my sister was just an artist, and all four voted to stay in. So now, yeah, we successfully bought an artist. We bought my brother and sister share back from the IRS. We just finished. That's so, awesome. So great. So me, I've, I've always owned 5%. I bought you know, my share of the winery back way over like 91, 95 period that I bought it over a few years. So I've owned 5% for quite a long time. And then uh, with my mom's trust. So yeah, so now my father's widow and my brother and sister. So I basically run the outfit for my family. That's incredible. It is incredible. Now, I mean, having four people vote to stay in, it was really, I, I, love so my, I love my family. They were, they were really tight. I really couldn't have uh, successfully done it. I, I, I like my ownership group a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's what it's you kind of like our group. It's kind of the same kind of thing, right? Yeah. Family business. Yeah, yeah. So we touched on first off the movie a little bit, and I'm sure that you know Hollywood, Hollywood did it up. A oh yeah, bit. very much so. Right. The true story would have been about eight minutes long. Well, <laughs> well, that's what I'm interested in, right? Because you really are. Of course, there are some head figures in uh, American winemaking, California winemaking. But you have to argue that your family is one of the largest. I mean, we went through a couple of different periods where we really screwed ourselves. One with the prohibition, it really did its best to damn American winemaking, right. right? And then once everything gets rolling again, there was a lot of shit wine out there. It, just, yeah. it wasn't great. So you have this thing that is beautiful. Mike Gergich at the helm, right? So right. he's making a beautiful wine. How did it go from you decided to take it over into the Judge Mike Paris? How did that happen? Oh, well, okay, so, yeah, you get in our time machine, it's 1976, yeah, that is the American Bicentennial. Mm -hmm. Steven Spurrier at the Academy of Nevada, his partner at the Academy of Nevada is an American woman named Pat Gallagher. Pat Gallagher, remember that I said we read a very successful Daily Times, the most influential critic in the U.S. at the time is Bob Balls or Robert Balls or another mm -hmm. unsung hero in the American wine industry. He was our first cheerleader. Uh, for Napa Valley Wines, and he was a, a serious cheerleader. I mean, like wearing the dress and the pom pom. The first outwardly gay guy you ever met. Super flamboyant, but just such a powerhouse. And at that time, the LA Times um, Sunday subscription was like eight million. Now, just really influential. So the great California wines are getting really good traction in California. And Pat Gallagher tells Spurrier about it. So she comes over to California and goes scouting for us because she's American and she's visiting the U.S. And so she goes around and visits now. And so she was the first one who ever came to Chateau. So then when Spurrier came over, they go, let's have a party. Let's just have a demonstration of the new American wines. And let's just have it. So then it wasn't originally supposed to be a competitive, you know, wine tasting or anything like that. But then to make it cool or try to get some press coverage, whatever they're trying to do to promote us from a wine shop and a school. So then they decided to make it. So basically, Pat Gallagher and Father the Wines, then Steven Spurrier himself came over and visited us. And he did, he bought the wines. And, and so then they were, uh, can we bring them to the taste? So he selected the people that, that he wanted to put in the, let's just call it a show, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So and he wasn't too sure, but he's just taking them to Paris for the American, let's celebrate American wines at the Academy de Valles for the new California, the Napa and Sonoma. So then, for one reason or another, you'd have to ask Pat, you know, she's still alive. If you read George Tabor's book, he probably explains it quite well. I don't remember exactly how it morphed into the blind tasting. So, but basically all the wines got there. And like the movie, for example, and when they write the screenplay, they take things that happen and they move them in time a lot. Or they make them more dramatic than they actually were. So, like the part where, they're, and, and the, God, I can't tell this story shortly. <laughs> the Napa Valley is extremely welcoming to the new people. It's John and Janet Trefath and Jim and Laura at Trefath and yeah. Jim and Laura Barrett at Chateau, Jack and Jamie Davies, mm -hmm. and um, Bob and Noni Travers at Maya Thomas at the time. So Andre Telechev, the great winemaker of VV, gets together with uh, Joanne Dupuy, put together this tour for the new American winemakers that are moving into Napa Valley to go with Liz and Louis Martini and Andre Telechev and that kind of stuff. And they all go off to France 
to learn about how do these chateaus work, right? So they're all over there. So those are the ones that took the balls and wine for them because of the e, pretty EU and the customs limit. So they all carried the two balls of wine over. So it wasn't any drama of any right. sort of right. It was very organized. That's kind of and really historic, though. You had the yeah. Tuckins and you so, had so, martinis and you right, had. Right, yeah. yeah. And so the wines getting there was from Joanne Dupuy and, and this Andre Tell Chef Tour. That's so, yeah. awesome. so that's how the wines get there, right? So, of course, in the movie, they make it like it's at the airport and sure. the old rigmarole like that. So, uh, they they get it in there, and um, it was, um, you know, the, the rest is really very much yeah, history yeah, yeah. that, you know, that, uh, that we had the right wine in the right place. And, uh, and, it, and then, I mean, if you think about it, you know, uh, what if Stags Lee doesn't win? Not the winner. What if Mile End win and Rolling Stags Lee? What if Fremark Abbey won both? Yeah. Right. So, you know, you got, well, this is the lucky thing about my plan. It was the luck of the Irish. My, like I said, my grandparents are Irish. I got an Irish passport the whole night. I was very Irish in there. Not with saying Norwegian farmer game, which is my stubbornness. And that's part of like, you gotta be stubborn to do this. You know what I mean? It's like, do it over and over and over. And it's always want to make it better. Yeah, you kind of hard headed. And that's where my Marty side comes kind of in, hard headed side. But the, um, the, I forget where I was going with that one, but the, uh, just the lucky yeah. shot. So, so we went out there tasting. And California wine business is still exploding. This is 76. It's just, you know, people are starting wine. So Mike Gerges, Croatian immigrant, that's an American dream. Austin Hills, a little coffee, big coffee brand on the West Coast at that time. So I was, hey, I'll put in all the money you put in the brand power and you can own half. So Gerges, man, he's a Croatian immigrant. Are you kidding? This is the best thing ever. So poof, he's out of Montalana. And he takes his whole song crew with him, except for the lowest level guy, because his team. Right. Like I told sure. you at the beginning, this yeah, is, yeah. why making is a team sport. You, it's like Justin Meyer taught me, is making other people believe in the dream too. So you got, like, I do not do this by myself. I have so many people making this magic happen. It's, it's just a, Absolutely. A big, it has everybody has to believe him. That like the lowest level pruner guy has to believe that he's not pruning a grapevine, he's making balls and wine too. You know, so everybody's got to have that same kind of kooky, driven passion to do what you do. So anyway, um, with the uh, the Irish luck business, Jerry Looper, the only guy that nobody knows his name anymore, but he was one of the great American winemakers at that time. And we thought Jerry was cool because he played Eagles on the car and the beer. Because this remember this is the post hippie era, right? right? So '76. It hasn't been that long since Hay Ashbury and all that stuff. And I'm a California surf guy, you know, I think the Beatles are terrible. I love the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to a West Coast kid. And uh, so my dad, Jerry comes back from his uh, year in Europe and he's looking for a job. And so Jerry Looper, formerly of Fremark Abbey, hires on as Jim Barrett's new winemaker. By this time, I'm at Fresno State because I'd done five years as my apprenticeship with my Gurgage, five harvests with Gurgage, 72 through 76 with Gurgage. And then I'm at Fresno State, and Looper comes in and he's got no cellar crew. He's got no cellar master, he's got no lead cellarman, he's got nobody. So Gurgage had left the one lowest cellar worker, cellar worker three. The newest kid who was just out of Fresno State had less than one year experience. His name was Gary Gallon, later became Gary Gallon America. So Gallon, Looper says, I need to get an assistant winemaker. And Gary says, you should call Bo Barrett. He's changing up at Fresno State. So Jerry Looper, I was like, hey, Bo, this is Jerry Looper. He tracks me down. This is way before cell phones. So he tracks me down at my house in Fresno. And I was living in Clovis, going to school in Fresno. And, uh, Jerry goes, hey, your dad hired me to be his winemaker. I said, ah, oh, that's wonderful, because you know, we loved Jerry. Like I said, he played the Eagles, he was cool, yeah. good guy. Oh, by the way, that's Gallo guy. Technical, precise, you know, everything's really good. Mike was technical, precise too, don't get me wrong, but Jerry had a lot more red wine experience than Gurgis did, so because he'd been working at Fremark, and he had been the winemaker for the wines in the Paris Taste. Mike Gerges had been a lab guy at BE &E and an assistant over at Madavi, so he was never a command winemaker. So my dad looks out, gets a good command winemaker, and Jerry becomes my next mentor because I finish up with Fresno and uh, I hire on with Jerry, and now I'm the assistant winemaker. So this is something that's really not true in the movie, too, that I never worked with my father until I came back from Paso. So then I worked for Jerry until 1980, wine business is still going, and now I've been my journeyman. 
when I was done my apprenticeship with Mike Gerges, my journeyman, another five years with Jerry Looper, and now I have got almost 10 years of experience. And this is at a time when people were walking out of UC Davis with no experience in getting a playmaker job. So now I feel that I'm ready for a command job. I go tell my dad that I'm ready to be the winemaker. He says, yeah, good, you probably are ready to be a winemaker, good luck. Because I got a winemaker, his name is Jerry Looper. And so, <laughs> see you later, kid. And uh, so I take off, and uh, the winery I was working for is now called Ancient Peaks. At that time, it was Indian Creek. Uh, after that, it was Creston Manor, owned by Alex Trebek, and stuff like that. So the first winery I actually personally- That's like the Santa Margarita Ranch? No, it's in Creston. Yeah, north is, yeah, it's in Paso. Yeah, yeah. It's in like East Paso, yeah, all the yeah. way over to, yeah, so it was up in Creston. And I was out in the middle of nowhere, I was still hermit out there. It was also like my afternoon break was like get a box of 22s and go shoot ground squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be a really good shot with eyesight. But um, so yeah, so so then uh, my dad calls me up out of blue because he says, hey Jerry, Jerry Quitty got a partnership offer that he went down to Boucher. And uh, I said, whoa, what are you going to do? He goes, well, you're not going to believe this, but Jerry recommended you for the job. <laughs> And I said, what? Because I had just started with these guys, and I was just getting ready to plant the vineyard. Like, seriously, I was growing it. Uh, oat hay for race horses and stuff like that, just do farm and stuff. And uh, remember, I went to Fresno State, you know, so we, we don't only farm grapes in Fresno. Right. You know I mean, I could, could have been doing prunes fine, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So anyway, off I go. So uh, my dad calls me up, and now this is a, a bit of an issue because um, my father is extremely anti-nepotism, and that's why I never worked for him at this time. I was always, he was in the Navy, he was in the submarines, I was very U.S. Navy, like, I worked for the, the chief of the boat, he was the submarine master, he's the chief, I worked for him. Or I worked for Jerry, who's the captain, and I'm the lieutenant, you know, so I was very, I'm not working for my dad at all, I'm insulated by two or four layers from working from our ownership. So I'm just a cell worker, assistant winemaker, I just do my job. So then, my father was um, an attorney, a singles tennis player, chess player, a very driven, uh, competitive, um, you know, a t a really a, a pretty tough guy. And, but he was a brilliant winery owner because he stayed out of because he knew he didn't want to make wine or drive a tractor. So he would always leave all that to his professionals. So Jerry, or Mike, ran the winery. Jim was very laissez faire, Ronald Reagan president. He just met his pros make a decision. So he set the goals and the standard as the philosopher king, but his creativity was always by the better people he hired, by his attorney hired, by the people he hired, and he always turned that over to us. And so then I talked to him, I said, okay, look, if you'll give me the same latitude and freedom that you've given to Mike and Jerry, then you know, let me do my job and don't interfere, because he was very non-interfering with those other guys. If you don't interfere, and he said, well, if you make crappy wine, can I fire you? I said, oh yeah, you, you're more than welcome to fire me. So I go, okay, it's a deal. So we compartmentalized when we went fishing or skiing. My dad was also a really fun guy. Like the first day the Snowbird Tram was ever open, he had me and my brothers on that tram. You know, learned to fly, learned to dive, fishing. You know, we had a ball together. And we had just tons of fun, but we did compartmentalize it. When we were at the chateau, he was the owner, and I was his captain. And that was, that was the way it worked yeah, until really to the day that it was really a great relationship, but it was completely compartmentalized. Going skiing, he's getting the hoodoo, and I could call him an idiot. Like, Dumbass, you know, don't, don't be scared. You know, be you know, stop your snivel and be brave. You know, <laughs> but if I said that at the winery, stop your snivel and be brave. Yeah, that's some more day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, but he was he was a great winery owner because he set the standards that we all had to live up to. Which is brilliant when you think about it, right? Because that's that it's his first winery. He yeah. wasn't in the wine industry. It, this is what he did, but he knew how to run and operate. Yeah, Maybe one of the one of the best wineries, you know, in California yeah. at that point in time. Right? He, he, the only thing it was that he had that vision. And uh, that he could convince other people of this, and like he would say to his winemakers, including me. Now, again, when we didn't have hardly any money, it's like, if you could if make sure, you know, I'd ask him to give us some money for something. Uh, I said, like, will it make your job, will it make the wine better? And I guarantee it'll make wine better. Will it make your job easier? He said, it will definitely make my job easier. So then we'll find a way to be done. Yeah, so he, great. he was one of those kind of owners. You know, it's like he did let us do stupid stuff, and um, 
you know, he he passed on buying a couple of vineyards that I wanted to buy that we still lease now. He leased them instead of buying them. California, you can only lease them for 33 years. None of my leases are expiring, and it's like, I wish that he'd let me buy them at that time with those prices, which at the time they were expensive, you know, time value of money and everything. But I, I wish that we'd had a couple, I think those are the only really regretful decisions I had that he made that he would not buy them in, so he just ended up leasing them. Because he was about my age, now 68 by that time. And he goes, ah, you know, I don't even buy green bananas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> do you, are you and your family running the wine the same way, the uh, winery the same way he did now? Because you have a winemaker, right? And you have, mm -hmm. like, I mean, are you... Yeah, it's, it's actually fairly similar. Matt's just turning 30. Um, and, uh, and then our new vineyard manager. So it's a little bit like when I came in, our vineyard manager, Tom Larry, the guy who had taught me to farm, he was getting into, into his 80s and he was getting ready to retire. So I brought in one of my Fresno State buddies, Dave Fowler, who started with us in 84, and he just retired this year. So then I had hired Cameron here, why I kind of stories, and then of course I'm letting him pick his vineyard manager for the next 30 year career of the guy. So I can try to get more lifers in there. So we are people that really want to train. So we got a new vineyard manager who's just an outstanding young man. His name is Cameron Wolf. And he's really excited because he's so excited about his job. Whereas the guy who's been farming the state property for 30 years, he's not excited yeah. about it. He's just like, oh man, it's Ross production. And I got the guy, I'm not going to go front. <laughs> yeah, 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 having the young blood, it's always it's an awesome thing. So now I kind of see it, yeah, it's the, uh, the core values of the company have not changed at all, other than I think that, but I know the, the farming side a little bit more, so are we a little bit more like a a European or a Bordeaux Chateau guys because you know I grew up, became a man on this property, I've spent my whole life building it up and it's treated me well and I've treated it well and we really believe in it. So the core philosophy has not changed at all. The mantras that you know the tradition of excellence and all those kind of things remain the same. It's just that that my ability to work in numbers is less far because as an attorney, that's an emotional world and stuff like that. But as a farmer the numbers and the scientist side is my methodologies and understanding of forecasting and um, you know like we're going to be out of wine in two years that's really clear and understandable to me where you know and i wish my dad you know like and we're not even trying to sell a 20 ever you know we have the heartbreak of not bottling any 20s like right now as i'm sitting here today the bottling line should be ch clanking away making you know napa valley cab so our three and a half week bottling every march you know how long it was this year? Two and a half days. Gosh. Because we don't have any red wine. So it's, so then for our customers and stuff, for people that are our world customers, like we actually tell them now, say, hey, when we get into the 21, because we that picked out at about 60%, so we got zero for the 2020 reds because of the fire. And then in 2021, with that super droughty conditions, we had the year the wines really didn't grow well. So we got in the cabinet and we got about 60%, kind of like 2015, so like really hardly any grapes. The Chardonnay was okay. Zinfandel actually picked up pretty good, but the cab was super light. So I get out and talk to people, so you kind of say, we're well, still farming. So do we, is it a little bit like Burgundy where they get the frost and the hail and all that kind of stuff? So we're, we're kind of in that environment where we never did, but you think about we have all the way from 74, really, until 2020, where we could make any wine. You know, in any agricultural enterprise, that's an insanely good track record. You, know, you get those four years of good production, especially in the 90s, when it's 10 years in a row, where, where Napa Valley Cabernet basically takes over the world. And that, and that was a function of a couple things. Unprecedented, 10 great finishes, all the way from 90 to 2000. It was unbelievable. It had never happened before, and certainly hasn't happened since. But nowhere in the world, not Bordeaux, not Australia, not nowhere, did you have 10 great vintages in a row. Co-located in time, was a mighty power Roberts, uh, Robert Parker coming in at that time, and the wine spectator exploding and dominating the promotion of Napa Valley and Northwest Wines, where there's the 100 point scale from Parker. And then, you know, that's when the cult wines all get invented, you know, when you get the Screaming Eagle, the the Screaming yeah. Eagle, yeah. and Moose, that Dalla Valley, and all that stuff. That's kind of following because, you know, all through the 80s, it was Montalena, Garage Car Reserve, Garage Car Reserve. Uh, you know, Fremont Abbey, you know, those were the powerhouse things. And that precedent leads into the cult wine thing later in the 90s. And that cult wine thing takes off because a couple things happen. 
there's more talent available with the smaller venues and so instead of just Montalana or Robert Dog Reserve, now you have a Barron in front of you. That's the heyday of Ed's and Rod, you have like Moon, like Barron, which is total. It's Chateau St. Jean, you know, these are, like, that, I'm just talking about the Cabernet. On the Chardonnay side, it's still Robert Dog Reserve, and also on the Chardonnay, Chateau St. Jean is a massive powerhouse, yeah, making amazing ones. Barron's are Prime Reserve Chardonnay, also an amazing one. So in our competitive tastings, what we're blind tasting against our, you know, Pierce head, those are the guys there. Then it goes into the you know the cult lines in the nineties and you know the world just keeps the it just keeps the you know growing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Get out of control. So with twenty twenty I know you said you had no production and as you said, uh, you made that call pretty early on. Was that because of fire? Like did yeah. it affect you smoke directly or smoke? Yeah, smoke tank. Yeah. No, just, okay. <laughs> this is a funny story. So <laughs> you guys you you let's what we call it like this. So I had dealt with smoke before. So on one of our terraces, we did not know the, the, they needed to mow the terrace face, so there's boats going on the terrace face and the terrace. And so one of the little kids that lived on the ranch, his job is to walk around with a shotgun and chase birds. You know, he's, he's a grade school kid, maybe 12, right? So he's walking around with his shotgun. At that time, they sold these bird chaser shells, which is a 12 gauge with basically an M80 firecracker in it, right? So you go, boom, and you shoot this 12 gauge shell, it lobs it out about 100 yards, and then it goes bang, and it scares away the birds, right? So this kid's walking around, his name's Kevin Bell, our vineyard manager's son, who lives on the property. He sees a jackrabbit in the grass at the base of the hill. He goes, oh, I bet I can make that jackrabbit jump really high. <laughs> this is at harvest, right? So it's super dry. So he boop, shoots the firecracker over the jackrabbit, goes bang, the jackrabbit jumps straight up and runs away. Ha ha, this is funny, all of a sudden there's a puff of smoke. So he starts this grass fire, and the next thing you know, we got two bulldozers and the air attack bombers putting out this grass fire, and it's burned up into one corner of the Cabernet Frog, right? So, but the Cabernet Frog's pretty ready to pick anyway, so we picked the Cabernet Frog, and it is like a total smoke bomb. And this is, this is way back, this is like maybe, uh, let's see, he was born in 88, so maybe it's probably 10, maybe 98, something like that, way before the fire. So we get this Cabernet Frog, and it is, it's like horribly smoked, it's just like bad. So, we try fixing that, we just keep spending money on it, spending money on it, finally we just got to toss it, you know, it was just like really bad. So I had worked with smoke then, then in 2008, our recent got smoked by a fire 100 miles away. Wow. And you couldn't even taste it at all. So, so that was in the Shasta Trinity fire, that's part of all the recent. The fire was 100 miles away, and the recent got some smoke. Very, very low level, barely protected. So what I did on that one was like we ran through the reverse osmosis or something, and then you take the permeate from the RO machine. So the same thing you use for de-alking or you know be taking the you know, VA out of wine, the RO machine. So you take that, you run that through the carbon filters, so and you strip out the smoke, and then you put put the wine back together. And it was really really difficult, very expensive, and that was just on a tiny little lot of reasoning. So I said this does not work because it just kept coming back, coming back, coming back. So but it was only we could taste. Nobody, only me and. The, my assistant at the time could really taste that. And so what we did on that one was I bought some um, sauterne barrels that were pretty smoky. So they used to be no chemical light dissolves light. So I basically put a thicker layer of sweet smoke over the fire smoke, but it was never really right. But again, it was just like the Riesling. And we told everybody this wine has a little anomaly, because our Riesling does age really well. And so, and so, you know, people like German sure. Riesling. Yeah. So, we said, we told our people, we were very honest, like, okay, this wine has a little bit of an unusual character, it's a smoky barrel, you know, I didn't say that you got smoke on the fire, but I said, it's a little smoky, because I tried to experiment with these sauterne barrels, but they bought the wine, but we saw them, I said, of all the reasons we ever made, don't age this one. So I just knew the smoke could be fired, so during the first wave of COVID in 2020, I was coming back, Montana was still open, kind of like Florida, right? So I'd gone up to Montana, go fishing, and we're flying home uh, from Bozeman, and that's Seattle, the, Santa Rosa, and we get to the Mendocino, basically at Ukiah, and everyone starts flying in circles. And every time we went around in a circle, I look out the window of Mount St. Helena, where my vineyard is, it was covered with smoke. From the LNU fire, that was the first one. And I'm in the airplane, and I'm texting Matt, looks like it's over, you know, because uh, the smoke uh, from the first fire, so I got home, started looking at it, and all that, and the grapes were so good that year. It's just such heartbreak. And then when the second fire came, that was I just nails on the coffin. That was like super blue and healthy again. It was it was over before it started for us. 
because I had worked this one before and I knew it can't, there's no way for my customers that I would actually sell them wine that was anything that well, our idea of trying to make it as much yummy, as much beauty as you can, and um, that we didn't even, like, we just stopped working on the menu. As soon as I got back, that was the first time I said. So we did all of our due diligence, you know, sent it to the lab, had tests, and did one, we, took, we released our interns immediately so they go to Washington, Oregon, our, our seasonals, we released them on the spot. We, want, we don't have pump over for you guys, go ahead and take a job in Oregon, Washington, so we all bugged out. We kept one a girl from Fresno State to do our bucket for ferments to keep confirming what we already knew, that, you know, this is a dead duck, but we stuck kept, you know, wishful thinking, you know, because farmers were eternal optimists. It's all going to be better, you know what I mean? Right. Maybe the smoke them go away because we have the sea breeze now. <laughs> well, I think it kind, of, it, it kind of, like, lends to, like, let people know, like, you know, if they want your wines, they're going to have to start kind of buying them now, right? I mean, that's going to be, yeah, it's you're going to be short on some wine here. Yeah, we would normally be bottling them now, yeah. and the year bottling after that, so, yeah, we'll be really short of wine. Now, you know, uh, the good news is um, we do make about 20-25% Chardonnay still. Mm -hmm. And the White Sassau Blanc Chardonnay, because all what we did with those is just go to all the cluster press. So we did, you know, we'd run through the destammer because you want to minimize in case they're going to pick up any smoke. And they did. So the, the whites are quite beautiful. So yeah, those are those are yummy and delicious. Really yeah, so we, we just did the 21 Sassau Blanc a little bit ago. But uh, when we did the 20 shard uh, last August, it was quite, it's quite lovely. Yeah. It's such a heartbreaker to hear. I mean, you, when you have harvest, it's not just at that one period in time. You spent all year working on it. Right. You dedicated everything to that vintage, and then it just goes away like that. You, you don't do anything in 2020, and that looking, I can imagine, I'm thinking as you're saying and you're in the airplane and you're looking out. Heartbroken. Oh, what yeah. a moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, that, that was even worse, because like you said, so we work in the Trinity of Art, Science, and Farming, yeah. and this is where on your tripod, the science leg just fell off and the thing just falls over, you know what I mean? So we had put in all the labor and love of the farming and we're so much looking forward to the art because that's the creative part. It's like the most, it's like the funnest thing we do is like, the, you know, pumping it over and tasting it every day. That whole creative, you know, and building and shaping the wine. It's your thumbprint. It, it, it's, it's what you do. It's why you do this job. And to have that taken away and, and to add insult to injury, the grapes still look yeah. beautiful <laughs> and they still taste Fantastic, because remember, when there's sugar in there, the smoke doesn't come out. Because when the sugar is gone, the smoke comes out. So you can walk in the vineyard, and we got good at taste. And it's like, oh my, this does have it. But to have, so, like, I'm driving my truck through the vineyard back to my house, and I'm just looking at these grapes, and they're so beautiful. And we can't pick us in one. It, it, was, the, it was it was soul crushing. The question I always think about is like, can you do? Can you sell that fruit off to somebody who makes alcohol products, or do you just drop that fruit and go on to the next? We just drop fruit and go on to the next. The weird thing about it, because you think about scotch, for example, how yeah. the smoke comes over the still yeah. from the peat, so the smoke comes over the still. Well, bad news: the smoke from the fire also comes over the still. So the guys who did it would like distill it and run it through giant carbon filters, so they essentially made vodka, they just super stripped it, so they couldn't make brandy or anything you know, good out of it. So some people made some spirits out of it, but again, you have to just stop hammering the money, because you already hammered it out the farm. So, you know, okay, now I'm gonna pick them and crush them and try, and now I'm gonna pump them, spend a lot of electrons pumping it through an R roll machine, and keep changing the carbon filters and refreshing those, you just keep throwing money at a problem that, in my experience, cannot possibly be solved. Of course, everybody else, now they all know the same thing too. So anybody who did pick their 20s, like, you know, they, if they tested them enough and you got a clean lot, like, there's a couple of 20s that I've had that are, um, you know, acceptable, that are not really smoked. But in general, ours are, well, you know, that's not, that's not my business. My, my business is selling excellence. Yeah. And they are. They're all. We, you know, we had to taste their other wines today. They were brilliant. And you know, I think a lot of people. Uh, these are, these aren't big production wines. These are small no. production no. wines. You know, and they're delicious. And they're, they're legitimate. You know, wines. Like they're not like this. You know, over extracted. They're just beautiful. And you know, they have phenolics and they have, 
you know, the Zinfandel just blew my mind. That just blew my mind. <laughs> it blew my mind um, for sure. The only the only Zen that I've had that kind of compared to that for California for me yeah. personally, everyone's yeah. uh, palate's a little different, but. For me, is that that GLF? It kind of reminded me of that. It's a little bit on the lighter side. Yeah. It's more elegant. It's not zenny at all. If you blind the right person, they might even call it like a Zen or a, a Pinot, right? It's it's elegant. It's, it, it's to me, it, re it reminded it's, me of like what Zen was 20 years ago. Right. right. Yeah. Well, when it was still table wine. Yeah. When yeah. It was still table wine. Yeah. Because okay, so you know, where we work is in the table wine thing. Once all of the 14 alcohol ideal perfect and milk and all going to make one guy who wrote basically the winemaker's bible is name it and it. And his ideal white wine, yes, again, using back to my triangles, my trinity, his trinity is acid alcohol pH for the texture and flavor of wines. What you're going to add all your, what's going to hold the beauty is you got to have this balance. Balance, in German, balance. The balance is everything. So, Pinot, knowing and making wine, white wine, the acid alcohol pH are very clearly limited. Up to and including 14 alcohol, alcohol enhances mouthfeel. Immediately, over 14, alcohol accentuates bitterness. On our Otherwise, it's the same thing. So, 14 alcohol is the ideal table wine. Alcohol is actually 14. And you get the most mouthfeel, and you're not accentuating your bitterness. So, then on your pH, though, on white wine, you got to be down there between. And it's like an Alsatian wine, I think his range was 3.2 to 3.4 or something like that. And over 3.4 it's hard to prevent malolactic, under 3.4 it's hard to get malolactic to go. So that's why California wines are all malolactic because they're in general over 3.4. But we actually work in the Pinot range designed for 3.2 pH. And the acid should be between 6 and, six and 7 grams per liter. So red wine, pretty similar, but the pH is way up there at 3.6 to 6. 355 five, and 37, so you have a little softer mouthfeel, and the acid drops down to the five to six and a half grams per liter. So you look at that little. Those are the traditional Bordeaux, Burgundy experience grown everywhere from the classic textbook Euro style winemaking is in that fairly narrow range. And so that's what we call either the structure or the balance for the and the mic parlance, the style of the wine. So what happens in California, they start pushing the alcohols up to accentuate bitterness. How are you gonna get rid of this? Let's add some sugar. Where are we gonna get the sugar that won't ferment? Oh, because pentose is not fermentable. So why are all those high alcohol wines so oaky? Because you have to offset the bitterness and the bitterness with red wine, right? So Basically, that's a lot of why these really big powerhouse uh, Cabernets at the 16 to 17 alcohol range, why are they like one or two hundred percent new wood? Yeah. It's a, a good way yeah. to add that whole mouthfeel and then as, a, as, as you regain that balance that our palates are looking for. So, you know, those ones, so, and also remember, a lot of Americans now drink just a glass of wine. Like all the critics, especially Robert Parker, he's judging it on five sips. He's not judging when the bottle's gone. Right. So, and he was a good friend. I was on his A team. I used to travel with him to golf and shit. But remember, he, you're judging that wine. The wine is judged on the first sip. Our customers are judging on the last sip, mm. on the last sip out of the bottle. Yeah. And that's that's the world where if you make the wine for the critics, you live by that sort, you die by that sort. Yes, the collectors get it. But they go in there, so we call them the aquarium wines. Look, I've got my super duper hundred pointer here, and we call them aquarium wines. Well, we don't eat those fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the aquarium wines. So I do not want to be aquarium wine. They can go in and genuflect before their aquarium wine, but I want them pulling the bottom on the land and enjoying that very, like the last little bit in the bottle, because that's where I want to enjoy it rather than that first sip for the craig. That's fair. I, uh, we had someone open up that uh, 96. Chardonnay. Yeah, out his there. Birthday was shocking. His birthday was so good. Well, you know what I got out of that? Um, it's uh, I, I've known that the Chardonnay is an ageable wine, right? And I, I, in my opinion, I think those Chardonnays last a lot longer than that. Um, but when that opened up, I was very interested to see how it did, and I still thought at that point this has so much life to give. It was still drinking really nice. That. That's because of that acid alcohol pH field. So, the, so because using those traditional Burgundian derived numbers, having that 
three to your pH is what drives that ageability of those wines. And so that's why they go, if you don't over make them or pre age them. Now, these are all good wine making tools. You know, when you go back to the art or the craftsman, use the metaphor you like your toolbox or your paint box. I don't care which one you use. But when you're making a Chardonnay, I want my Chardonnay to be more up on where everything comes from God. So basically, all the things, the decisions of people. Or the terroir that includes the hand of the man who makes the decisions, or the woman, let's be fair. So, if, you know, I decided I have a very manly vineyard, I have a uh, you know, gunpowder vineyard, or whatever, or my terroir, or I have none. Lots of vineyards don't have any really soil mineral characteristic, and they still make great wines, so don't get me wrong. And then I said, I'm going to use 10% new wood. That 10% of wood is always going to be 10%. I'm going to use 100% of wood, that 100%. So as you add the flavors, well, I'm going to do partial ML. I don't want all butter. I only want a little bit of butter. Or I want, oh, man, my people really would love the butter. That give, give us the oil. That give us the grease. I'll make an oily wine out of Chardonnay. So those are really good artistic or craftsman decisions of what you choose to make. But you do start messing with, they get do it. Uh, Malaitic, for example, the pH you start at 3.2, it's going to be 3.4 when you're done. And that's why they have, they have to do it in, like, you know, Chablis and uh, Burgundy because they're, they get a pH 2.9. Nobody's going to be able to drink that. Like, you ever drink German wines where you get the acid not in your stomach from the malic? That's the malic. It's not digestible. So let's get rid of this malic acid. Well, where we grow in Colorado, where we grow, we don't have enough malic to worry about. It's like where the French wine is finished, that's where we're starting. So why do an ML? You don't need to. Why should I add the butter? Well, if I want to add butter, then I'm going to do it like it. You know, so you got to make these artistic decisions, but as long as you can make them within that. Well, it so you see the classes like me and Heidi and Sue Welch and you know, Kathy Kors and Dan Dunn. You know, a lot of us are getting a little bit older, but there's some young ones, Steve Matthias, he's going out the other way yeah. to, the, to the super tart side. Um, and a super minimalist, because I'm kind of a minimalist, not sure, but he's, he's not a super minimalist. For sure. And, uh, Great ones. Yeah, yeah, and he's, he's a really good dude. And uh, so you see, the, but that is where, sort of back to the art, trying, and he's a super good farmer, too, because we were buying a bunch of Steve Chardonnay, too, for our Chardonnay. He was farming for us for a while until we lost half of these. Um, and so, but, you know, the, uh, anyway, but you have to make those decisions. So, like, I, I think I told you I'm partners in the bottling line with Dave Ring. Yeah. Right? And Remy makes an amazing angel with Chardonnay, too. But what Dave does is he's got a different, I'm not a minimalist. He's actually, uh, you know, a uh, wild yeast aficionado. I actually believe that wild yeast are nothing more than compound yeast, more than one yeast running at the same time. I don't, I don't, I don't believe there's such a thing as good wild yeast to make a good stable wine. What I think is you get compound yeast, like on a Riesling, to make that complex, we use compound yeast in there. So it has three different, one tank's got two yeast, well this yeast is going to die at seven alcohol, and the other yeast is going to finish. The other one, this one's going to die and leave a little bit sweet, but that's going to be your, you know, two grams per liter. So you get all this, you know, compound yeast, so you get the complexity, but you also know what the wine's going to do. It's not going to go off the reservation. I know that my family business, I can't afford to lose one. Yeah. You know, I, I, can't, I, I can't take a penny that's supposed to be, you know, $50 a bottle and then sell it for, uh, you know, 8 bucks a gallon. That, I, I just can't afford it. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so, but, so, going back to my, you know, my friend and colleague and, you know, a worthy adversary and competitor, David Raymond, you know what I mean? He's a good dude, but we're still competing for the same chart and place on the wine list. Yeah. And uh, his wines are brilliant. But so he does the Tamel because it's the Russian River. He does the Batanaz to add a little texture because, again, it's Russian River needs a little bit of texture. So he's trying to bring his wines, his hand of man, where his winemaking is more evident as wine, less than us, which is basically totally focused on the vineyard. And that is the other you know, beauty of what you guys do. You get to talk to me or Dave Rand or anybody else. He'll tell you the other story, and he might say, oh, yeah, those guys are about to go. And they're like, they're like throwbacks. You know, they, they, don't, they don't do anything. You know, They just sit back and press it and bottle it. I think we're very lucky to have people like you on and, and other winemakers and other owners of wineries we can master songs because we definitely do get a lot of information that, you know, again, there's things that, you know, you tell us, we're like, I've never heard that before. So we're able to pass that on to other people who are listening or watching. And, uh, you know, you're busy, you've got a dip, you got a wine dinner tonight. Yeah. You, you know, you did a wine luncheon already. Yeah. 
And uh, we just appreciate you have time for us. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. And it's like a pocket store talking about wine. That's my thing. That's what I do. Yeah. It's like make wine. Don't get me going. So even further than that, right? It is what you do. You do travel around. You do tell us stories. That is, at the end of the day, that's what you are. You're the face for your brand. When you sit back at the end of the day and you look at Napa Valley, where you came from, to what it is now, how wild is that? I mean, that's it's got to be trippy for you to see that. It is. It's that uh, you can't. It's like, when there used to be you know, 30 winers in Napa Valley, now there's about 300 or something like that. It's just crazy. Oh, there's got to be more than that, right? And it's got to be coming back, too. Like, of course, you know, during COVID, right? It was really, you weren't getting the tourism. Now it's, from what I'm hearing, it's getting very busy. Yeah, because a lot of people, as you know, especially when Europe was closed, the people that can't go to their summer in Tuscany or wherever, and they had it all coming in Napa Valley. So, yeah. And it's um, it's so busy that, like, for example, us, we used to be open to the public just walking to go to the tasting room. But now it's reservation like yeah. they just can't handle the crowd. Because again, say our hospitality, it's got to be all this quality. And you know, for us right now, we still have to be closed to the week because we can't get the good people that are to do the response job of telling our story appropriately. You, know, so you just can't get anybody to uh, tell our story. So, so yeah, we're not right now. We're, we're open. The reservations you can get them. We open a couple more private tasting rooms, um, but it's it's yeah, it's busy. So we're, we're doing good. Uh, as soon as COVID came off in California, the locals definitely were started coming out, and uh, people were really excited to be out off the reservation. Yeah, because the rest of the country, I mean, granted, you guys are in Florida, it wasn't like what we went Very well. in California. Absolutely. And, uh, Texas and stuff, and people that are coming from the really you know, bad states, um, including Alabama. Yeah, Alabama yeah, was tough. Yeah, that was really bad. Like, I like this story, so during COVID, uh, the most people we have is in hospitality and the invitation, and that takes a lot of people to oh. One good tasting pour, he needs his glass washer, and, and, and the housekeeper got to keep the toilets clean and all that kind of stuff. So, but during COVID in California, we had the sensible, where you can still work, and not a sensible, where you had to stay at home. So all of our hospitality that wanted to keep working had to transfer, and so the essential was maintenance, grounds, some office to support production, which was also winery production. Yeah, in our, so all the guys in the tasting transferred into maintenance and uh, grounds and video. And they were doing stuff like, I'm not kidding, it was just total make work project, like picking up rocks from the vendor and lining the islands of the lake. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anybody who wanted to keep running the paycheck got to keep That's running awesome. Kept everybody working. Let's ship everybody working. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, thank you for telling your story. Yeah. Yeah. Right, you're welcome. We really appreciate it. Really, it's an honor to have you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Go Mariachi. Welcome to Atlanta. All right. Thanks, guys. Great. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Great. Thanks.